Now that we've identified where all these receptors are located, um, we'll talk about some of the agents that we can use. The most common 5-HT3 antagonist we have is ondansetron or Zofran. Our typical dosing for this is four milligrams and you should give this about 30 minutes prior to emergence just for it to work properly when the person wakes up. In general, this is rather benign. There is about a 10% risk of headache with this and it can prolong QT as well. Most people will end up getting ondansetron, even if you're low risk. For uh, targeting your histamine receptors, people will think Gravol is sort of the prototypical drug for that, uh, and that is dimenhydrinate. Now, dimenhydrinate is actually just a combination of two drugs, being diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl, and 8-chlorotheophylline. And I'm not going to write out that whole word. Um, but they basically needed a drug for the Navy that would um, be similar to Benadryl in terms of its anti-emetic effects, but was less potent for sending people to sleep. So they added this 8-chlorotheophylline, uh, which is a xanthine, so basically like caffeine. It's a stimulant. So either... Gravol or Benadryl are just fine for targeting your H1 receptors. These are particularly good for nausea, vomiting that are coming from your vestibular system, but just remember that opioids can also potentiate re your response to vestibular inputs, and there are also histamine receptors on the nucleus tractus solitarius, so you're probably also targeting the area that integrates all the information directly by giving a histamine antagonist. All right, for uh, muscarinic antagonists, probably the most common that you'll see is scopolamine patches. And I think these are more of a consumer item than anything, so people will wear these if they get car sick or, um, or seasick for a cruise. And then we will more often use something like atropine in the OR, which is a muscarinic antagonist that crosses the blood-brain barrier. So it will have anti, um, anti muscarinic effects. For dopamine receptor antagonists, we have basically two classes of drugs that do this. So we have the butyrophenones. And I find these challenging to remember the drug class names because we don't even use the second one clinically, which is the phenothiazines. I should say we don't use these anymore, but Haldol is an example of a butyrophenone. So Haldol, um, in the range of one milligram IV dosing, will be quite effective for decreasing post-op nausea vomiting. Metoclopramide is also a dopamine antagonist, but it does not work as well as Haldol. But I should say this is a very good prokinetic. And it's contraindicated in complete bowel obstructions for that reason. All of these dopamine antagonists are contraindicated in Parkinson's disease because you could precipitate an acute dopamine withdrawal. This would cause hyperthermia and rigidity, so you have to avoid that. These neurokinin-1 receptors, our medication for this is a prepotent, and our dosing is 40 to 80 milligrams PO, and this has to be given pre-op. The major disadvantage with this is that it is rather expensive because it's one of our newer drugs. Uh, CB1, we don't use because they don't work. And then for steroids, DEX, dosed four milligrams is your anti-emetic dosing, four milligrams IV. You can go up to eight milligrams for um, anti-emetic purposes, although since four milligrams is shown to work, there's really no reason to use these higher doses unless you're using it for their opioid sparing uh, purposes. So given at a dose of 0 0.1 milligrams per kilogram, you can potentially use less opioids 
which then would help with your nausea vomiting situation. For all of these receptor targets we've talked about so far, they're all about equally beneficial in the 20 to 25 percent uh, reduction of relative risk range. So that's a number needed to treat around four to five for every one of these medications, which is why you're using a number of agents for someone who is at high risk, because really you're only reducing the risk by about 20% for any medication that you use or any class of medications that you use. We should talk about GABA-A receptors as well, because propofol is a very good antiemetic. So for post-op nausea vomiting that is very stubborn, you could consider trying a bolus of propofol in PACU. So 20 milligrams IV, so about 10 times less than your induction dose, would produce a plasma concentration that has a significant effect on your uh, amount of nausea. Or you could run an infusion of 25 to 30 mics per kilogram per minute intra-op. And this will reduce your post-op nausea vomiting. Midazolam also works on GABA-A and a dose of 2 milligrams IV 30 minutes before emergence will be about equally effective to giving on Danzatron prior to emergence. The obvious disadvantage of this is that if you give someone two milligrams of midaz right before you're trying to wake them up, you could delay your emergence. And so there are disadvantages to all of these medications or potential side effects. And that's why we don't just give everybody all of these medications to try to minimize their risk. Uh, steroids, for example. Steroids, for example, do decrease your insulin sensitivity. So in people with impaired fasting glucose or diabetes, you could um, cause issues with hyperglycemia especially in the 6 to 12 hour range after giving the medication. The dopamine antagonists can cause extrapyramidal side effects. The muscarinic antagonists have anti-muscarinic side effects. And histamine antagonists tend to make people very tired. Let's just summarize this with some prevention strategies for avoiding post-op nausea vomiting. So if we avoid volatile agents and nitrous, we will potentially reduce our risk. If we try to avoid opioids post-op. So use multimodal analgesia, NSAIDs, Tylenol, ketamine, lidocaine, avoid neostigmine. I didn't directly talk about neostigmine before, but we know that neostigmine is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, therefore increasing the amount of acetylcholine that we have. Acetylcholine is the agonist for muscarinic receptors, so we'll have more activity on these muscarinic receptors, which is known to make us feel nauseous. The reason you're using neostigmine is typically to reverse the effects of your non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers. Uh, you might consider the importance of redosing your rock or just letting the rock uronium wear off rather than needing to give a reversal agent like neostigmine. Um, in general, just using multi-class antiemetics. So just targeting a number of these different receptor types. So don't just keep adding more um, antihistamines. Try targeting muscarinic receptors and serotonergic receptors. And use of propofol because it itself is an antiemetic and we should put regional anesthesia on this list. Using regional anesthesia we are um, again decreasing our likelihood of needing opioids post-op because we have directly blocked the site of pain. I think that's a pretty good summary. What I should add is that Obviously, post-op nausea vomiting is unpleasant for the patient, and we should try to avoid it just for the sake of them having a pleasant experience in the OR. But it can also be associated with significant morbidity as well. There would be the potential for wound dehiscence, delayed discharge from PACU, or even unanticipated admissions to hospital uh, for people with unremitting post-op nausea vomiting. 
Imagine a situation where someone's jaw is wired shut after a reconstructive surgery and what would happen if that patient were to end up vomiting. That would significantly increase that patient's risk of aspiration because there's nowhere for the emesis to go. And that's a patient who, regardless of these guidelines, you would probably aggressively prevent post-op nausea vomiting because the consequences of that would be much more significant.